Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for this day comes from the epistle reading, 1 Peter chapter 2, especially verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. One thing that I had to leave behind in Colorado, one thing that I would desperately love to have with me here, is my first car. In fact, it was my only car until we went to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then Holly's car became my car. And then I crashed Holly's car. And then we have a Volkswagen, which is now our car. But my car still holds a very, very special place. It was a 1969 Pontiac Catalina, 20 feet long, 6 feet wide, 2 tons of American steel. And my uncle, exactly, actually my great uncle, he bought it brand new from Leo Payne Pontiac in 1969. Well, that car has outlived the dealership. It's now outlived the brand. But when it was first bought, it was a beautiful, beautiful, I can't even describe it, electric sort of green. And my father has recently had it repainted that color, so I can almost visualize it now. But when the car came to me finally, and when I drove it, it was no longer that beautiful green, but more of a, of a sickly faded olive color, the kind of olive that you would throw away for fear of being deathly ill. The rear quarter panels were rusted. Cylinder number six leaked a little bit of oil, and the engine didn't exactly purr like it used to. It sounded more like a, an asthmatic cat with some spitting and sputtering and coughing. It was such a wreck that my friends used to joke that the home prices would drop every time I'd come to visit. No one in his right mind would want this car. But the thing is, I loved that car, and I still love that car. Now, when I look at it, I see those beautiful lines curling up from the bumper, gliding past the sides, tapering down to the arced taillights. I see a powerful car with a 400 cubic inch engine and 310 horsepower. I can go from zero to 30 in that thing in about half a second, and another 20 or 30 seconds from 30 to 60. But I saw a car that has 300,000 miles, actually 387,000 miles, over 300,000 miles of family road trips, of playing highway bingo, of listening to my dad make up stories about why I should look for falling rock because he was this poor lost fellow out in the mountains of Colorado. His name was Falling Rock. We had to look for him. 300,000 miles of riding back and forth to school, of waving goodbye to my mom and fighting back tears because I just wanted to be home with her. It was 300,000 miles of family 300,000 miles of love. And brothers and sisters, the way I look at that car is the way that God looks at you. You with your rusted quarter panels, with your faded, chipped paint jobs. God sees in you those 300,000 miles or 10,000 miles or however many miles you have. And he says, yes, I pick you. 
I will do anything and everything to make you my most precious possession. And the truth is that you weren't always God's most precious possession. Not by a long shot. In verse 10, Peter tells us in no uncertain terms, once you were not a people. You were nothing. I was nothing. Every single person here was absolutely nothing. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking to yourself, probably, oh, pastor, Peter's talking about the Gentiles, right? They weren't God's people like the Jews, like those of Abraham's seed. I can't believe you don't know that. Well, stop it. You're half right, but only half. Of course, Peter was talking about the Gentiles, but he was also talking to the Jews. And you see, the Gentiles at that time heard not a people, and they nodded their heads in approval, saying, You're right, Peter. There was a time when I was not a people, for I am not a Jew. But the Jews back then also heard not a people and immediately thought of the Old Testament from Hosea chapter 1. And the Lord said, Call his name not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. They too nodded their heads in approval thinking you're right, Peter. There was a time when I was not a people. But wait, how can the Jews be not a people? Well, remember the words of John the Baptist in the Gospel of St. Matthew. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees were coming to his baptism, and they said, excuse me, he said, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For you see, it isn't lineage or breeding that saves. And it isn't lineage or breeding that condemns. All people born after the fall bear the stain of original sin. It's that first crack in our relationship to God. And our continued sinfulness is the wedge that is driving deeper and deeper and deeper into that crack, ever expanding it to the chasm, the chasm between God and us, that it is so wide, so wide that we have no hope of bridging it. Too wide for the Israelites, God's own chosen people, to bridge themselves. But fear not, because Peter goes on in verse 10, but now you are God's people. And you are, without question, without doubt, without condition, God's people, because Christ Jesus hung on the cross, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was made man and was crucified also for us, for you. And that was the only way that we could be reconciled to God. Christ needed to die so that we might live. And Christ was nailed with two planks of wood. And with those two planks, he bridged that impossible gap that separates us from God. And through Christ's perfect sacrifice on the cross, we can boldly approach the throne of heaven and cry out, Abba, Father, and we will be heard. You are his child, fully and completely reconciled, and he has placed you in his body, his body, the church. And we belong and have a new family here. Not a family of lineage or breeding, but a family of holy adoption with our true Father in heaven. Once you had not received mercy, separated from God, there is no gospel. Separated from God, there is no forgiveness, and there is no hope. There is only the law, for it is written on our hearts and it stands in ever-present judgment over the fallen world, telling us, there, you did it, you sinned, there again, yes, aha, uh -huh. you sinned again, and the wages of sin are death. 
Now, if you think of it, that idiot on the highway, the one that wouldn't move over for you because you're driving right on his bumper, oh, yeah, you were a good person, right? You didn't honk your horn. Well, how about that lady at the supermarket? You know, Mrs. Cartful of Groceries in the 15-item or less lane. Really? Don't you know how to count? Is she really that selfish? Is she really just in such a big hurry? Yeah, sure. In both cases, you didn't actually do anything. You didn't express your anger or frustration. But inside, up here and in here, did you think something maybe less than kind? Even for one tiny moment, one millisecond? Now, great or small, it doesn't really matter. The wages of sin are death. And that's it. The law finds you guilty, and the only punishment is death. Always death. And be honest, did you sin this morning? Will you sin this afternoon? Will you sin even before you leave this building today? The law demands absolute perfection. And there is no mercy under the law. You are guilty. We are guilty. I am guilty. I know that I've not kept the law in perfect obedience. And I know that, that you know the same. We have indeed sinned. And it doesn't matter if it's in thought, word, or deed, or, or even on a whim. And that's why we confess, I, a poor, miserable sinner, Confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But Peter says, Now you have received mercy, for Christ has made satisfaction for our sin, for the sin of the world, for every sin that was committed then, every sin committed now, every sin committed into the future. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, for just as you, speaking to the Gentiles, were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, meaning the Israelites, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And how wonderful is God's love that he would handpick you, you who were not a people, to be his child. That he would consign all to disobedience so that he could have mercy on all. Mercy on you. See, even though you were once not a people, God has always wanted you for his treasure. Isaiah says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And you are indeed his most precious possession. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And being a chosen race and a holy nation, well, that sounds really exclusive, right? And it is. Jesus tells us exactly how exclusive. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And sadly, not everyone believes in Christ, even some people in our very own families. Some are militant, and they'll try to make you feel stupid or small or shun you because of Jesus. Some are apathetic. They might not hear a word when you witness to them. You yourself might be that person in your family 
the one who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. Or you might even have your doubts. But fear not. Fear not and cling to Christ, even in the moments of doubt. Because God earnestly desires for you to be saved. He desires for all of creation to be saved. And so he sent his Son, our Lord, to be propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And this was always God's plan. For Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world. And so in this very exclusive club, Christ is and always has been our membership card. For we are his royal priesthood. We belong to God himself. The Levites were the priests of the Old Testament, and like you, they belonged to God. And when the twelve tribes of Israel were dividing the lands of Canaan, the Levites were the only tribe who were not allowed to own land because the Lord God of Israel is their inheritance. So said Moses. And like the Levites, you, as his royal priesthood, have no land, no place in this world. For just as Jesus said to Pilate regarding kingship, my kingdom is not of this world. And as God's royal priesthood, you don't wear royal garments made of gold or silver, decorated with precious threads. You aren't buying a new Vera Bradley handbag every week. You don't have a, a Monday Mercedes, a Tuesday Audi, or a Friday Pontiac Catalina. No, your royal garments are actually far more precious than these or all the treasures of the world. You, royal priests, are clothed with Christ and washed clean in his precious and holy blood. And God has handpicked you, handpicked you in order that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, Peter beautifully illustrates this deliverance being called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We need deliverance because we were born dead in sin. As St. Paul said, the night is far gone. The day is at hand. And so God has called you into that marvelous light, the day that is now dawned with Christ Jesus. And he has called you by name. It's a personal invitation. He knew you as you were being formed in your mother's womb. He knew you even before you knew yourself. And he has been calling you out of darkness this whole time. And the day is at hand. That marvelous light that is Christ Jesus. He the light of the world. It is he into whom you were placed. Placed in his light in your holy baptism. Now, whether you were an infant or an adult, whether you remember it clearly or only remember the date, when you were baptized, you died to sin. The old Adam was dragged down to the bottom of the River Jordan, and he was drowned. But you did not die with the old Adam. You went into that river of baptism already dead, and Christ himself takes hold of you, and he lifts you out of the water and raises you from the dead, and keeps you in his light. And you are God's most precious possession. You. And he has given you his most precious gift. Life eternal in his son. And now a new man lives within you. You are dead to sin, and you are alive to in Christ. Remember always that the Apostle Paul tells you in Philippians chapter 2, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so as Luther said, then out with it and freely and openly confess this before the world. Preach, praise, glorify, and give thanks. 
point to the cross in all that you do, and through the new man proclaim his excellencies. He has called you out of darkness, out of the shadow of death, to make you his most precious possession. And God chose you. He will never let you go. You are, in my analogy, his 1969 Pontiac Catalina. Well, actually, it is, it is so much more to say the truth. You are his precious child. Amen.